Thank you for joining us. For those who don't know, uh, Cliff Pickett is back here again. Uh, today, he's going to be diving into Adobe Lightroom and putting your workflow on autopilot. So just as a reminder to everybody who's joined us on live stream, as well as Facebook, if you do have any questions, please make sure to drop them in the comment section. Cliff is more than happy to talk about them and get them answered. Uh, anybody who's joined in and was a little bit late to the show on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab. That's how we get any questions over to him as well. Uh, but otherwise, we're really excited to bring you this content. Cliff, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Scott. Scott, I'm going to task you with one thing. Thank you for the introduction. Just to keep you on your toes, I do want you to monitor the chat room because I do want to encourage people to ask questions. That's what we're here for. We have a very limited time. I'll try and answer them as quickly as I can, uh, but I want to keep it a little bit more engaging. I'm not going to be monitoring the chat room because I'm going to be focusing on my screen. So if anything is pertinent that comes up, feel free to you know interrupt me and we'll, we'll see if you can tackle those questions. Awesome. Awesome. So you guys heard it here first. Drop those questions in, get them in. Cliff's ready for them. And I'm, I'm ready for them too. <laughs> uh, if you guys have additional questions too, uh, just shoot me an email. You can Google my name, Clifford Pickett, find my website. I'll bring it up later as well. Um, there's just a lot to cover here. And there's, uh, if you have a question, just reach out anytime, honestly. But having said that, there really is a lot to cover here. We, this is a very small window. This is like the tip of the iceberg, essentially, to a larger program that I create, that's my Lightroom Bootcamp that I typically do annually, maybe once or twice a year. That's coming up next weekend. So if there's a lot of this is too much to take in, don't worry about it. I spend a lot more time one-on-one, -on -one, really engaging with people, using their own computers, their own catalogs, their own photos, walking through every aspect of this. So you're fully set up, it's sort of like getting in your car where you just know where everything is. You know, you know where the buttons and the dials is. That's what it should feel like when you open up Lightroom after you take one of these courses. It's just, you just know how to do things. It's that frustration just completely disappears and you're doing things the right way. So what I talk about when I do these boot camps is it's so critical for me to give people back time because time is the most precious thing any of us have. It's the only truly limited resources that we have. And right now is the most amount of time that you'll ever have. So for photographers, our time is precious as just humans, our time is precious, but we spend a disproportionate number of hours in Photoshop, in Lightroom, in our just kind of maintaining and taming that beast, so to speak. So today is just a little bit of an opportunity for, for me to take the time to show you how you can save time. This is an investment in your time that will pay off in dividends. The boot camp that I do just goes into a lot more detail, um, but I think this is going to be a really good step in the right direction. So I use the word autopilot in the title of this for a reason, because I do want my concept, my idea of what the perfect workflow is, is the least amount of work possible. That, that's it. That's what it comes down to. The least amount of work we can put in possible. We want more flow and less work. That's for two reasons. One, your time is precious. But two, we're, we're flawed creatures. We make mistakes. We're not consistent. And that's a really big aspect of this. If we're forced to do something over and over again, we're never going to do it the same way twice. And that's where our workflow really starts to get into trouble. We choose different folders. We choose different ways of doing things. Maybe we just choose not to do it all after a while. So putting on autopilot is just as much of a time saver as it is just a way to keep things more consistent. If we automate something, it becomes more consistent. Okay. Having said that. Cliff, I just uh, want to I'm jump in real quick, just because sure. I think this is, I think there's a great lead in question before we even get started into any of the Lightroom yep. stuff and talking about some of the nitty gritty is Sophia is joining us here on Facebook and wanted to know what are the requirements to use Lightroom? What are the requirements to use Lightroom? Take one of these courses from me. That's the first requirement Two, have the software and three, just have like a basic understanding. Either there isn't much of a requirement otherwise, um, there is a cloud component. If you get the, the cloud version, that's been out for several years now. Um, some people might be using the legacy versions. The cloud version is going to give you several advantages. One of them being the cloud, meaning that you can sync your images to your devices. I'm just starting my timer here. So I know not to go too far because I can go on for hours. I'm going to set this to 50 minutes. How about that? So I can kind of keep a rough idea of the time. Um, the, the cloud is a really nice advantage, but you don't absolutely have to have it. Today, this is a question I'm not sure if some of you may have tuned in afterwards, but when we first got started, uh, we were talking about which version I'm using. I'm going to be using the desktop version of Adobe Lightroom. This is what I consider the professional vision, version. Uh, there is a cloud-based one. It's just called Lightroom now. That's like a desktop version of Lightroom Mobile. So there's a Lightroom Mobile. That's the one that goes on your phone or on your iPad. There's one that's just Lightroom. 
which is the, the basically the desktop version of Lightroom Mobile. And then there's a professional version, which is Lightroom Classic now. It's a little confusing, but we're gonna be working on Lightroom Classic. I really want them to call Lightroom Professional. Uh, it just gives you a few more uh, options, a few more things that isn't necessarily available in the other platforms. One of them being external drives. So I get it. I'd see why Adobe does it because they putting things in the cloud, putting all your stuff in the cloud is great. It, it Especially for me, I'm on the road full time. This is actually when we first went live. Let's talk about being in a van down by the river. Uh, I was kidding. I'm, I'm broadcasting from Vegas right now, but I'm, I'm living out of a truck camper, traveling across the country and working as a professional photographer and consultant full time. Um, so being in the cloud is really nice because I don't have to carry all of my stuff with me. It also comes with drawbacks, such as a wireless connection here in the desert can be challenging. So for those of you who are looking for a very easy way to get into this, sure, the Lightroom cloud or just Lightroom might be a good start. But understand if you're getting into this for more of a professional aspect or you really want to dive into a larger archival system, the desktop pro version does give you a little bit more uh, power and capabilities. The biggest one, one of the biggest ones being that you can use external drives, uh, among other things. So you can really manage a large amount of data. Okay, um, let's dive into this a little bit. Uh, I want to go to my Chrome web browser here real fast. And just to give you guys a breakdown, this is this is how my mind works a little bit. Sorry for that. I'll just give you a little bit of an insight. This is my bootcamp. This is a mind map of what I do for my bootcamp, which is going to be next weekend. And for those of you just tuning in, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a discount and some more info at the end of this, but it's September 11th and 12th, 14 hours. It literally goes through everything. Um, so this is a breakdown of everything that's covered. It's literally every aspect of Lightroom, everything that you need to know. And it's not just me telling you these things. It's helping you discover and understand why they work. And so we're, we're using it to our advantage. We're leveraging all the power. Um, so this goes on and on and on. And it's actually neatly organized if you pay attention to it. I'm not going to bother you with that right now. So what I did was I created a separate one just for the presentation today to kind of keep me on track a little bit on just how to speed up Lightroom and put this on autopilot. So I'm going to focus on just these areas today a little bit. And we're going to talk about the import, the throughput, which is basically the post-processing, what you do after you import your images, um, the library a little bit, and then how to automate your backup, and then also how to export. So it's quite a lot to cover. I'm going to try and tackle as much as I can. If you guys have specific questions about any of this, feel free to ask in the chat room or just shoot me an email afterwards. Um, I mentioned it before. It's just cliffordpicket.com. It's pretty easy to do, so reach out. Okay. What I'm going to do is start brand new, start fresh, and kind of meet you guys where you are. You know, I, what I couldn't stand about those cooking shows is they get on there and they're like, oh, add this mash and add a touch of this and this ingredient, and they have all their ingredients with them. I don't have, I don't want to start that way. I really want to keep this real. So if I go into my Lightroom here, I'm going to create a file, new catalog. And one of the ways to really speed Lightroom up is to put your catalog on your fastest drive. I demonstrate this during my bootcamp of what drives are the fastest, but essentially for most of you, the internal drive is going to be the fastest. So we're going to go to our pictures folder here, and I'm going to create a new folder, and I'll just call this b &H demo for now. Uh, and we'll call this b &H demo. So the folder is called b &H demo. The catalog is called b &H demo. If there's questions about single versus multiple catalogs, I've gone into this in a few other presentations before in, in extensive detail. Uh, I will say a single catalog is absolutely the best way to go just about every single time. Uh, I'm working with multiple organizations, even the US government actually, trying to help them design a workflow. Using multiple catalogs, multiple users, is it creates a nightmare. Imagine going to a library and having multiple floors and a catalog for each floor. How would you ever know where any one book is? Right? That library analogy is actually a very relevant um, analogy, really, for, for how we manage our files. You know, how you manage a library is very similar to how you manage your, your library of photos. All right, so we have a brand new catalog here. Now I need to import my images. What I'm gonna do is go to Finder, and I created a folder because I'm assuming that many of you are tuning in because you have a little bit of a headache with all of your images. So I just titled this whole thing headache. I put some loose images in here and some random folders. All I need to do is drag this right on top of Lightroom. That's gonna bring my import dialog box. Now I'm gonna click add. This is gonna be a little bit different than if you import a memory card 
Because from here on in, moving forward, you just need to import your memory card. You can only copy your images off of a memory card. That's just a safety feature. There's a really good reason why. Um, so we're just going to click add. And I'm going to, you know what, just for this, because I think my face might get in the way. I've probably said this more than once, but in a live Zoom call about Lightroom, I'm going to see if I can stop my video. Let me know if that's okay with you, Scott. This way, hopefully, my face gets out of the way. You can see the full screen. I'm going to click Add. I'm going to click Import. So Add basically just means point to. This might pop up. This is the first time on a new catalog. Enable Add to up. What that does is for any images that have GPS, which are essentially your cell phones, very few DSLRs, I mean, those cameras have GPS, um, that will reverse geo-encode or geolocate your images. It's just a fancy way of saying it's going to take the GPS coordinates of that GPS unit, your iPhone photos, and just give you a city and a state, a sublocation and a location. So you could say enable, that's fine, that's kind of cool. It's a nice feature to have. Uh, we're going to touch on that in a little bit. So this is what we have, one big headache. <laughs> right, we have, I want to talk briefly, very briefly about how we organize our images. So we have Africa, a few images from Africa, some trips you might be on. So it might, you know, occur to people and they may have even been taught, well, let's organize our images by, let's say, travel, right? So we can right click, we can create a folder. And we'll call this travel. And maybe I'll put some of my images in here. I have Africa. I'll put that in travel. I have India, I'll put that in travel. All right, Jackson Hole, put that in travel. Moab, but here's the thing. I was living in Moab for the last year. Is that necessarily travel? Is that home? It starts to become a little bit of an issue, right? So let's, let's just put a, a, a pin in that for a second. I'm not seeing all of my images, and that might be occurring for many of you too. So here's what's happening. When we click on a folder here, if I click on travel now, I'm seeing all the images in the subfolders. That's on by default. So this number over here, 13, represents the summation of all the images inside of all the subfolders. Here's the problem. Here's the first problem. If I click on headache here, we have a lot more images. And the reason is if I right click and say show in finder, headache here, I just open up headache, I have loose images in folders. That's the first step to creating a disaster. What we want to do is have a folder even contain, either contain folders or images, one or the other, not both. So here's a really nice step that people may not realize is I can turn this feature off, this feature to look at all the images in the subfolder. So I can just see the images in that parent folder, the loose images. So under um, library, I can turn on or turn off show photos and subfolders. If I do that, this is only showing me these loose images here. So now I can grab all of these and at least right click, create a folder inside, call that loose images. I think that's going to be a really big time saver for a lot of people. I'll include these images for create. And now I have a folder of just all the loose images that I need to organize. So now we have some folders in place. And now we have a bit of it of like a structure here. Here's a problem. Let's go to these loose images and let's see if we organize them a little bit more. Now I know that these were taken in India, these three here. So I can go to my India folder. These are taken in Ladakh. So if I wanted to, I can right click now, create a folder, Ladakh. All right, so I'm now I'm starting to organize this a little bit better. Then I get to Use some shots in, in Moab, right? So I can drag this into Moab. That's fine. Then I get into some of these other shots here. Let's maybe skip ahead. And here's some shots that I took in Mexico. We were filming an iPhone Corsair for two months on iPhone Mastery. It's, it's going to be a crazy course. Uh, I did one in Italy a couple of years ago. This one will be released in a couple of months. Um, but for now, we have all these images up to here from Mexico. So what if I create a folder for Mexico? Right click, create a folder, call it Mexico. Now there's multiple places inside Mexico, so this goes on and on and on. It seems like a good start, but here's the problem. The ones from Mexico, for instance, I was working for a client. So maybe I have a separate folder for clients inside of here. 
And then inside there, this is a partnership with iPhone Photography School. So I'll create another folder, call that iPhone Photography School. Now you're going to start seeing the issue appear, which is the issue that everyone gets faced with, no matter who tells them what about how to organize your images using folders. Now I have to choose where do these images belong? Do they belong in my folder for my clients? Do they belong in my folder for travel? Now, maybe I demonstrate some of these images for, for presentations like this. Maybe I have architectural shots I want to demonstrate for architectural presentations or a gallery, right? How do I go about finding these images again? That's a big problem. And now if I go about trying to organize these by folders, essentially every time I shoot, I'm faced with the decision of folders this belong. There is a problem right there. Fundamentally, no matter what you do, no matter who tells you what, no matter what presenter tells you what, whatever it is, trying to organize your images by folders is futile. It's never going to work for the simple reason of this. Your images can only be in one place. You can only be in one folder at a time. That doesn't work for most of our images, right? This is both a client and also travel and also architecture and also landscape and also presentations and on and on and on. Right? What happens if you travel with your family? Does that go in your friends and family folder? Does that go in your travel folder? What if you're traveling with your family for a client? <laughs> it goes on and on and on. So you get the idea. It's never going to work. So what we're going to do is find a way that we can automate the process of organizing our images because our folders are necessary. Our images have to live somewhere. That's the extent of our folders. Our keywords are very different. Our keywords, we can apply multiple keywords to the same image. So another nice tip for you guys is these are some of the images that may be attached to the, to the images that I imported. So I can just select all of these. Now, if I go to delete this, I can only delete one at a time. That's not going to work. So instead, if I hit this minus key, I can delete all these at once. So we're starting with a clean slate. Now we're going to go through and create a structure that's going to make a lot more sense and we're going to automate the whole process. So we're going to go to our keyword list here. Hit this plus icon. Every image you've ever shot, you can be found in three ways. One of three ways. Two. What? Let's say I spelled that wrong. It doesn't matter. These are very easy. You can just double click and fix that at any time. That will apply to all the images that are attached to it. It's not a big deal at all. Every image, if I think about, if I, and I go through some of my boot camp extensively, I go through every single student and ask them to name three or four photos. And once we go through the whole classroom, we talk about, well, how did you find these images? And every single time they talk about who I was with, what I was doing, or where was I? That's how we find our images in our mind. That makes sense. If we can recall an image in our mind, we're trying to reflect that inside of our digital asset management system. Now we can go to a place where, let's take those images from Africa make this a little bigger, hit this plus icon here. Now I can say where, this is in Africa. I can create a tag and say Africa. Add to selected photos, and now I can find them simply by going to Africa. I can go to that folder here, but what happens if I go to Africa multiple times, right? Now this also might be, what if I wanna find a giraffe, right? Then I can go into what? I can say giraffe. Here's a nice little shortcut that you guys can really take to your advantage, use, your, use to your advantage. I'm going to say Command-K. That's a shortcut for keywords. And I'm going to say giraffe is less than or inside of animals, which is less than or inside of O2 what? Now we have a beginning of a hierarchy. Is that starting to make sense? I know it's a lot to take in. I'm going a little fast. There's too much to cover in a very short period of time, but this is a really quick way. Now let's say we come across, um, let's just say that this is a draft, for instance. If I command K, just type the first letter, hit enter a couple of times, I want to confirm the other. Now I just made this a draft. Here's our two drafts. If I want to remove that, I can click the checkbox. It goes away on the images that I select. I can right click, go to folder and library, I'm back to that folder where I was. So that's the beginning of how this system works. The reason why that's important is, let's say we have an image. Um, I have, yeah, I took this image maybe a couple of weeks ago, whatever, so this is in New York City. I was back there before I flew out to Moab and Vegas. Um, New York City, 
So what I do, Command K, and I would say this is in uh, Midtown, which is inside of New York City, which is inside of, actually I'm gonna say Manhattan, which is inside of New York City, which happens to be where B&H is. Uh, I'm gonna say New York, I'm gonna say United States, which is less than um, North America, which is less than 03 where. Now we have this whole hierarchy, just like that. Now, why is that important? Who cares that much about it? At the very beginning, I said, I'm here to save you time. I'm, I'm finding ways. I've discovered a process that is the least amount of work possible. That's the best workflow you can have the least amount of work. Why is that so important? If I took this in New York City, Command K now, I could just type in Midtown. And it gets tagged with, if you look on the right-hand side here, all the other keywords up the list. So you're not constantly tagging and trying to find things. It's just the one keyword at the bottom of the list. It gets tagged all the way up. If you don't see that, that's because you have entered keywords. Select it. You want to choose keywords and containing keywords. You can also decide which keywords will be applied to the image when you export the file. So you don't have to worry about, well, yeah, I don't need that O2 where that doesn't help anyone else or O3 where I can double click that and just say, don't include that on export. All right. So some keywords are just there for your organizational standpoint. So now we have the beginning of a little bit of a structure here. Now we can go into, here's another folder. We just did some light painting in the desert outside of Vegas several days ago and brought some models in. It was really cool. So I'm going to say light painting, right? Cause that's how I would find this, but it's also has a location and there's also models. What folder does this belong in? It breaks down immediately. If I create a light painting folder, then it doesn't go in my travel folder for Las Vegas, right? I do one for photography and types of photography. So instead I could take all these images, command A and under what I can create one for light painting. Now also that's the what, I can go to where, and since I have one for the United States, everything we only have to do once, everything we do, we only have to do once. I can go to Las Vegas. I can say Nelson actually. And this is another way you can do it. So Nelson's inside the United States, but I can right click, create one for Nevada and just drag Nelson to Nevada. So the old school way of doing it, but it works just fine. Right, so now we can have multiple ways of organizing our images and it's fully automated. Next time I have come across an image that I shot in Las Vegas or in Nelson, because we shot there in multiple days, command K, type in Nelson, there we are. Really simple, really fast and easy to do. So if we go through the rest of these now, we have Moab. We can go to Utah or I could say command K, Moab, which is less than Utah, which is less than United States. There we go. I do the same thing. We have that for Africa already. We have for India. I can just drag these in. Oh, and I'm not seeing all of them. That's because I have to turn this back on. Show photos and subfolders. There we go. So it's important to turn that back on. You're just there to see the, the random loose images. It's a really helpful tip down. All right. So for India, I can do the same thing. Go here. We're going to go to where and right click India. Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I'm going to say Jackson Hole is less than Wyoming, which is less than United States. And you guys get the idea. We're just building this out. Just like that. And then Mexico is the last one. And we can just put that under Mexico, just save some time. Now, as you're adding this in clip, just a question that pops up sure. is, you know, you're, you're adding these keywords, which are great ways of categorizing all the images, but do you then go in and also rename your files or do you just leave them as hmm. they are? You don't need to rename your files. I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. I think when I import my images, but you don't need to rename your files. So check this out. We have Mexico, right? This is one way that we can find all the pictures of Mexico. 
then we can say, well, this is maybe architecture, right? So I can go to what? Architecture. These are also sunset pictures. So under what sunset? Sunset, there we go. Right, so we have multiple ways of, of finding our images now. So I could be anywhere in my catalog, and if I type in sunset, just the first few letters, I'll see all the pictures that have sunsets in it. If I type in Mexico, all the pictures that have Mexico in it, so on and so on. Now we have a much faster way, much better way, because now I can see, all right, show me all the pictures of Mexico, and also take me all photographs and sort by my filters here, by all the images that have the keyword Mexico. But I can go, if you're paying attention to the top of the screen here, I can change this to keyword again. And I can say, show me all the pictures of Mexico that are architecture, that of sunset. So it really becomes powerful as we start narrowing this down. This is why we don't use folders. All right, so having said that now, we're going to Command A, select all the images, save them. Command S, I'm using a Mac, so when I say Command, those who are using PCs or Windows, that's control. So Command S is gonna save this metadata to the file. But that means it's gonna save the keywords to the images themselves. Now, why am I doing that? Because once this is done, which it is, I'm gonna remove all of it. We're starting from scratch again. Because now that we just fixed the folder problem, let me show you what this really looks like. I'm gonna go back in here. I'm gonna to go to pictures. I'm gonna to go to the same headache. But in this folder, I'm gonna create one more thing that's really gonna help you guys. And that is, I'm gonna create another place for all of our images, all photographs. I'm gonna say just B&H demo, because I actually use that folder name, all photographs. <laughs> so you just call it all photographs. You want one place where all your images are to be. So now that we have these images in here, instead of choosing add again, choosing add again, I'm gonna say, move all these images. Then I'm gonna put my metadata in here. We can create a new metadata. I'm gonna say Clifford Pickett. Copyright. Clifford Pickett Photography. Copyrighted. All rights reserved. And I'm going to put in my email address. So I want people to be able to reach me if they come across this image online. This is why you don't even necessarily need um, watermarks or anything like that. This gets embedded in the image itself. The cool thing is when we do this, because this is putting things on autopilot, we never need to do this again. Every image you import from here on in will be auto tagged with your contact information. You can put in your country. I wouldn't recommend putting your address in, but you can put in your location, you can put in your phone number if you want to, or at least put in your email address. Every single image, we never have to think about this again. So that's another key point for the automation process. Now we're gonna click move, and this is gonna stay either copy or move the whole time. But we're gonna point this to where we just created that folder. Inside of pictures, just roll all these up, all photographs. Lastly, we're gonna go by date and we're gonna organize this by this very specific way, year, month, day. But why would we do that? Why would we organize our images by year, month, day? We know the folders don't work because our images won't be in more than one place. It can't be in more than one folder. Your file date, the time, the exact second that you press the shutter is the one thing that every single image has in common. Every single picture you've ever taken or ever took <laughs> Not token. Every image you've ever took, every image you will take has one thing in common, no matter where you are, no matter what you're shooting, no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, no matter what camera you're using. The one thing that every single image has in common is the second that shutter was pressed. That's why we're organizing this by date, right? We're talking about putting things on autopilot, taking the work out of your workflow. The way we can do it, the way we can fully automate your import and your organizational process is to find a system that lets the computer do this for us. The only thing that the computer can do for us from an organizational standpoint at the import stage at the moment is organize our images by date.
right? It doesn't know that this is light painting. It doesn't know that this is model one or model two. It doesn't know that this is a full moon rise, but it knows when I took these pictures. So from here on in, every single picture I take, it's gonna import it into all photographs. Never need to change this again. It's gonna apply your metadata, your contact information, your copyright information. Every single image from here on in, never need to do anything again. Now it's breaking this down by date for me. And I know a lot of questions are gonna come up. Well, I'm not gonna remember this by date. That's fine, you don't have to. If I wanna see the pictures from Africa, I just go to my keyword filter, type in Africa. Here's all my pictures from Africa. These folders are just there because that's how we automate the organizational process. If you wanted to, you can right click on a folder, go to folder and library, and you can rename this. And I'll do this for, I work with students all over the world and I basically take control of their computers, log in through Zoom and help them through every step of this process. Um, so don't feel overwhelmed. They're just kind of breezing through this to give you a rough idea of how we can automate our entire workflow. So you can type in Africa as long as we have this number first. Anything you put there is fine after that. We can go to the next one. Same thing, rename Africa. So on and so on, but all of your Africa pictures are here. What happens if we go to Africa all the time? We do workshops. We have several coming up. We have one in Nova Scotia uh, in October. We have Acadia, which we go to every year. We have Colorado, we have Jackson Hole. So I go to, let's say, Nova Scotia every year, right? I can have one for Africa, for Nova Scotia, but not just under where. These pictures from Africa, it can also go under a what? So that what could be maybe workshops. And inside of workshops, I'm gonna put a year. So this is 2013. Notice I didn't choose that folder name. It happened for me. So I'm gonna say 2013 Africa Safari. And why is that important? Because now if I type in Africa, if I can spell it, I don't even have to finish typing, I just type in the first few letters. You're gonna see that Africa shows up twice. Every picture I've ever taken in Africa is gonna show up here. But all the trips I go are gonna show up under my, my workshops or my travels or my trips. I have a folder called trips in my main catalog, right? So this is how we're gonna slowly build. It doesn't help for me to just show you what it looks like when it's done. I wanna show you how to build this. They're very easy to move around. We can move them inside of what? We can move them anywhere we want to. And then we can always reorganize this at any time. Okay, so that's the automation of the import. Now I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna show you what that looks like if I take a picture of myself. Probably sweaty over here because I turned the fan off. Um, let's put this on automatic. There we go. I'm gonna take a couple of pictures of, of where I am. If you guys have questions, feel free to, to reach out. Um, just to speak, there we go. We have one picture here. Uh, let me just bring this up a little bit. I have a time wrong because I'm still on night photography mode. There we go. I'm going to put this memory card in. And now let's put this to the test. The second you put the memory card in, Lightroom is automatically going to import your images. I didn't touch anything and it's gonna find these images. I don't have to do anything from here on in. This is on autopilot. The only thing you want to be sure of is this is checked. Don't import suspected duplicates, absolutely critical. All right, now all you have to do is click the word import. Notice how it says copy. All photographs in HTML. It creates a folder for me. This is the beginning of putting your workflow on autopilot. We never have to think about this again. Now, even if we don't like these images, I can come in here and I can call this. This is a two star, this is a three star. I have a whole process on how to call our images. If I take another photo now, I'm gonna take my memory card out, take another photo. 
Now, while, while you're taking some photos over there, Cliff, <laughs> uh, Sophia wanted to know, is, is there a possibility, do you have to worry about, is, is there an ability to, for people to strip metadata out of the embedded images? Um, people will do anything if you put them on the internet. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, let me get to that in a second. I wouldn't worry about it though. So here's what this looks like. All photographs, so these are the images that I had on my memory card earlier. Notice they're grayed out. I didn't delete them from my memory card. I didn't format my card. I didn't delete them from Lightroom. We're trying to find the least amount of work possible. If you get a large enough memory card, I recommend a 512 gig card. I leave my images on there for, for weeks, if not months at a time. As long as I have new photos selected, it's only going to show me my new pictures. So this is my primary or one of my first source of backups is the memory card inside my camera, especially when I'm traveling or living on the road full time. So I don't have to worry about carrying multiple drives with me. That's one way I can do it. Every time I take a picture, it's only going to show me my new pictures and it's only going to import my new pictures. Now I literally need to do nothing at all. I have a one click import. So that's the first step of this process is designing an import. And people don't believe me when I say that you literally just put the memory card in, you can shoot every day. I have clients in Alaska right now. I have a client in Africa right now. They're doing these really large, you know, multi-week long trips and every day put the memory card in and literally just wait a few minutes for it to determine the new pictures, go pee, go set the coffee machine up, whatever. When you come back, hit the import button and it's only going to import your new pictures and it knows what to do with them. So that's the date it organizes, organizes by data. I can right click, go to folder and library. I see me getting sweatier and sweatier over here. <laughs> uh, it's automatically going to organize by date. This will never change from here on in. There will never be not an exact moment where you take a photo. Even if it's 100 years to now and Apple's on their iPhone 111, it's always going to find and have a way. Any other system you use, it's going to change over time. So we're organizing our images by date. That's not how we find them. That's simply how we organize them. Next level of that is if we go up to preferences, we can go to Lightroom Sync here. And we can say, sync our mobile app. Basically, if you shoot pictures with our iPhone, we can automate the process of ingesting that into Lightroom mobile, push it up to the cloud, bring it down to our computer at home. There's a whole class on Kelby about this, the, the laptopless or computerless workflow, which I've learned in the world with just your phone and have it backed up to your computer in real time. I don't care if you're in China or Las Vegas. Now we have a specific folder. Right, we're going to choose the same folder structure, and I'm going to choose in my pictures folder all photographs BH demo. That's my parent folder where every image is going to live. Right, I'm not going to choose that now because this is a, a separate catalog. Every picture, whether it's my phone or any other camera, even cameras other people are using, this is a camera that Susan took and sent me the photo. It's going to show up by the date. Okay. So now we have the entire import stage process. And by the way, if someone uses, like I use this for an example, <coughs> um, Susan's camera stripped the metadata info out of the date. That'll happen when people share images. So a little secret handshake on how to do that with Apple, how to keep your metadata information in there. You can come up here to metadata and you can actually edit the capture time if you want to. Not a big deal, but you can if you really wanted to. So if someone's cameras are wrong. I'm on the West Coast right now. So if I didn't change the clock on my camera, I can select all of these, come up here, metadata. You're really smart about this. Edit capture time, and I can shift by a certain number of hours. Shift it back three hours or forward three hours. So really cool ways that you can manage this. There's not a lot enough time to go into how to do that all the, all the time, but just know that you can do these things. So we're automating our import, we're automating our organization by folders. So one click import for every picture you take from here and if you follow the system. How are we gonna uh, find our images? That's the next step. We know where to put them, how are we gonna find them? Yeah. Just a quick question, Cliff. Um, okay. I, I might butcher your name, so I apologize if I do, but I believe it's Tech uh, asked from Facebook, don't you have to configure your computer to automatically import? Uh, you don't, but there are preferences. Uh, if you go to preferences here, and under general, um, show splash screen on startup, show import dialog when a memory card is detected. This should be on by default, but if it's not, you can turn this on. Okay, so we have our folders set up fully organized, automated from here on in. 
one click import. Now we can, if I wanted to, I can right click and name this BNH demo. But more importantly, I want to find my images. Now I'm going to find my images the way we set this up, the who, what, where. Notice how these stayed once I imported my images. I wanted to start where you guys are, which is a folder structure that might be all over the place. This is how we can organize it, automate the process. We're not doing this manually. We're automating the process of organizing our images by date. Then we can go through each day. It's a lot easier to go through each day and say, right, these are me, these are Cliff. So if I just hit Command K for keyword, type in Cliff. That's easy enough, but it doesn't show up inside this system, right? It's the who. So I can put it under who. I can put Cliff under here too. Now, since I have that keyword, I can just type in the letter C. It's gonna automate that process. Great. What about Susan? Here's another way you can automate things. You can right click. We have a whole bunch of options here. One of them is put in put new keywords inside of it. You want to choose this, but you want to see new person keywords inside of here. You're going to see that little dot. Now, anytime I create a person keyword, it's going to show up there. How do we create person keywords? There's another automation process that allows us to detect faces because keywording people's faces will make you want to rip your hair out. So let's automate that. Let's put that on autopilot. I'm going to click on all the years. In fact, I can right click show parent folder. And here's that parent folder that we create. So here's all of our images. I can come down here to where you see this little face icon or hit the letter O. Show faces entire catalog. It's a small catalog, so it shouldn't take too long to do, but it's gonna look through all the images and it's gonna start detecting faces. You don't have to do this manually. If you have a picture with 10 people in it, it'll create 10 thumbnails, one for each face. Now it really comes in handy when you want to speed things up and batch process this, All right? So we'll let it work maybe for another five or 10 seconds. And then I'll show you how we can really take advantage of this. Are there any other questions that came up along the way? Okay. If there wasn't to go back to the question you asked earlier, you can find your images on the web, tenai.com. It's one way you can do this. You can also do a Google search. There's several ways you can do this. You can upload a photo and then see where it shows up on the web. A lot of people don't understand that you can do that. There's a few other Chrome extensions that you can use to reverse search images. So if you're worried about where your images show up, that's a really good resource. I know how to do it. Okay, if we wanna find a face now, let's look at, let's look at me, cause I'm, I'm in a couple of these. I can now type in Cliff. It'll create one for me. Now, if I double click on this, it's only gonna look for pictures that look like me. It's gonna bias that first. It's a much faster way than sorting through thousands of images, 90% of them are people you don't know, because it's gonna pick up every face. It's gonna pick up people in the background, every single face. You don't want that. I right, already get back to that screen. So if I want to find this model, this is a desert shoot that we did. That's how I'd find her face. I hit O. I can type in her name or just put in model one. So keep her anonymity for now. Um, double click and it's going to find her faces basically. So that's how we would do that. Okay. Next thing. So we have a way of automate the faces. That's the who. We have an automated import, we have an automated who. Let's skip to where. If I hit G to go back to my grid, let's go to maybe some of these images here. I know I took these in uh, Guanajuato. It's a beautiful city in Mexico. So let's say all the way up until uh, here. Right, that's Susan overlooking. This is what Guanajuato looks like. It's an, an amazingly stunning city. Uh, it's just, it's just crazy. It's uh, the inspiration for the movie Coco. So we filmed the whole iPhone photography thing there. So if I want to, I'm going to stop here, go all the way back up to here. I can go to map. I can type in Guanajuato.
Now, all I need to do if I don't have GPS built into these is drag these images right here. Now the GPS is built in automatically and it's gonna reverse engineer the city, the state, the country, the region, the location, the sublocations. So now we have a way of automating the face detection. We have a way of automating to a degree whether you have GPS enabled. Now we have one of these images and you're gonna notice as GPS because you'll see this little pin. It looks like a pin you put on a map. So here's what I recommend to a lot of my students and I teach this in the boot camp I'm doing next weekend as well is anywhere you go, take a picture with your phone while you're taking pictures with your DSLR. If you find a cool lake, if you find a cool billboard, just take a snapshot with your phone. So let's say this is a snapshot with their phone and we'll know it because a couple of ways, one, you'll see that pin. Two, you can go to metadata and you can sort by camera, right? We're automating the process of finding all of our images. Then I can select all the other images that I took from my DSLR that don't have that metadata, don't have that GPS. As long as I have my one iPhone picture I took in that same spot with my GPS, I can come down here to sync metadata and I'm gonna turn everything off. Check none. All I care about is syncing my GPS. And that's a quick and dirty way to automate the process of finding your images by location. So now if I click on a map here and you can do this for all of your images, you're gonna see a global map of basically where all of your files are all over the world. So now we can automate the process of geotagging our files. There's another way you can do it. You can buy an app, just um, geotag. You just go to the app store whether it's Apple or Android, type in geotag, a bunch of will pop up. They'll do the same thing. Just keep a digital breadcrumb trail of your images. Click this little squiggly line. What I'll do is keep track of where you are at every minute of the day. It's anonymous, don't worry about it. And you can say load track log. It'll create a track log. Just airdrop it or send it or email it to yourself. Load the track log. And then now that'll apply the GPS coordinates about where you were matching the time on the clock of your camera. It's another way to automate the process. Okay, so we did the import. We did a lot of the throughput already. Auto adjust, let's quickly get to that. We're already, <laughs> we have like 10 minutes left. Scott, let me know if we have more time because I'd love to, to spend a little more time if we do have it. Yeah, um, yeah, we, I can, be, we can take a little bit more time. Okay. That's okay. I wanna be you know, sensitive to that as well. I know you guys have other things to do. Um, I'm gonna hit G to go back to our grid. Let's go to, um, let's go to those images that I shot in the desert because typically when you do a night photography and light painting, the images can somewhat be dark. So let's start with here. And usually the first images, you're just getting your settings ready and stuff like that. This is in Nelson, Nevada. It's such a cool place to shoot. Um, so cool. But a lot of these might be a little bit dark. So what I can do is when I can right click, go to folder and library. So I just have that image selected by day. I do like working in the folder still. And I can even right click this folder and rename it. It is nice to see that, but it doesn't replace keywords, but it's just nice so people don't freak out. I'm never gonna see my images again. You can, you want a keyword, but you can also label your folders. Now I can select all these images and hit Command U. And you're gonna see them start to come to life. It's auto adjusting the images based upon a neural engine that Adobe built called Adobe Sensei. It's an intelligent way of, of automating the process of basically standardizing your images, recovering the highlights, bringing up the shadows, but it's doing a lot more than just a basic recovery of your files. They're using a neural network and, and leveraging AI to understand how you edit images and how other people edit images and referencing a database that it grows every single day that says, well, I recognize an image like this, a backlight full moon rise shot in the desert with the model. This is how I would edit this photo, or at least give you a launching point. Shift command R will reset it. Command Z will undo. So now we have the editing, at least the pre-editing automated. If you wanted to automate the white balance, so think about command U. Command U is saving you time. That's what we're doing here today. If I want to automate the white balance, I can say shift command U. And that will automate the white balance. Get rid of that little bit of like a purple or bluish tone to the images. Here's how we can take this a step further. I know it's a lot to take in, but again, we're breezing through this. I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg to let you understand, really help you understand what's possible to remove yourself from the equation. 
we're going to automate this on import. So we don't have to do this. You don't have to understand command view from here on in. We can automate the adjustment of our images and where they belong and the organization of it in literally one click. So to do that, we have to go into one of our images first in the develop module, because this is a hidden thing by default. It's kind of strange. Go to plus, manage presets. And you're going to have classic over here. If we click general under classic, now I'm going to take one more photo. I'm going to intentionally underexpose it. Automatically going to pop up once I put the memory card in Lightroom. One thing I have to do is under develop settings now, we only have to do this once. We have this option now available. Auto settings. I never have to touch that again. Every picture I take from here, I'm only going to import my new pictures. It's going to auto adjust. I didn't touch the computer, just automatically adjusted that picture. That's the original. That's the auto adjustment. So all of your pictures are now fully organized. I can right click, go to folder and library. Fully organized for you. There's nothing you need to do. One click import, put it in the right place automatically. Another way you can automate it. So now we talked about how to or automate the process of organizing and also processing our images. We talked about how to do the keyword tagging, automating the process of finding who they are and finding where they are. Let's go back to here. I'll click the fool there, so I'm gonna make that smaller. So we did the who, right? We have face detection. We have the what. Now the what is an interesting thing. That's sort of like, that's the mecca, that's the goal. That's what we're looking for. We don't have it quite yet natively inside of Adobe Classic. So here's what we can do. A couple of things, we do have it. Notice, notice I said natively inside of Adobe Classic. What you can do is, just to give you a brief preview, we can go to Adobe Lightroom.adobe.com. This is the web-based version if you're using the cloud. This is how you find your images. This is how basically you're using Lightroom's cloud to automate the process of pushing your images to your mobile devices back and forth and back to your computer. So this is a cloud-based component of Adobe. All the images that will show up here are images that you have in collections. Okay, why is this important? Why am I showing you this? For one, you don't need a computer anymore. You can just log in as long as you have images in collections. But two, here, this search at the very top is very different than a search inside of Lightroom Classic. Here, I can type in something like um, sunset. I can find all the pictures out of sunsets. I can type in, I don't know, leaf. Since we're getting into the fall, we just did the presentation yesterday on fall foliage. I didn't keyword these images. It's automatically recognizing through object AI. So it's there, it's coming down the pike. It's not integrated natively inside of Lightroom Classic yet, but it is there. Now we have a way of automating every aspect of both the organization and the import side, as well as the who, the what, and the where, the tagging or the keyword aspect of this. What we could do also is let's, let's look at, um, let's go back a second. Let's look at this file here. There's some plugins you can use in the meantime. You go to library, plugin extras. One is called Word Room. This one's gonna use object AI for you Re and, and recommend all these different tags. I can add these keyword tags just like that. And you do that for image by image by image. Did a pretty good job. Architecture, building, building, cityscape, construction, downtown. I'm gonna remove those, but that's another way we can automate the process of tagging, removing the pain and the time invested in doing this. We shouldn't need to have to do this manually. I'll get rid of all those. Another one, library, plugin extras, Xire. Now here's something interesting. I can say, let's just look at one of these images. 
I can search by example photo. It's going to initialize the catalog. So what it's going to do, depending on the size of your catalog, this might take hours if you have a, a very large catalog. It's a small catalog, so it shouldn't take that long to do, but it's going to catalog every single image and understand what it is about in a way that Lightroom doesn't do natively at the moment. So it's going to recognize cars, it's going to recognize cityscapes, so on and so on. Now you can do a search. If you come across a random image, because I get, I get it. Your images are not organized and you don't want to go through the process of having to do it. This is what I do for most of my students. <laughs> I log in for hours at a time and I organize it, either help them how to do it or I actually do it for them for several of my, my VIPs. Uh, and I just break everything apart, fix it, put it back together for them. So now that we have that organized or at least initialized, that's a better word to use, search by example photo, I can say use a more stringent or less stringent or restrictive uh, algorithm and show me all the similar photos to this photo. And this will search my entire catalog. So you have a picture of grandma, you have a picture of your dog, you have a picture of one image that comes across from a trip to Mexico. You're like, where did all those other images go? This is how you do it. It'll search by the one image and find all the other images and build a collection for you right here. You can then rename that collection and then keyword them appropriately. So we're automating every aspect from the import and the organization to the throughput from the who, the what, and the where, the how to find their images. Let's talk about culling quickly. Let's take that same folder actually. Let's take this folder here. I'm gonna say command U. That will automate just bringing this up to speed, just giving me a, a, a launching pad, that, just a jumping off point that I can use for editing further, but it really does help. I'm gonna go through here and I walk through, I spend hours talking about the culling stage, the culling process and how to do it the most efficient way possible in the boot camp I have coming up uh, next weekend. But this is just a brief overview. I go through one star. Every image has potential. One star, one star, one star, one star. This one not so much. I'm not deleting anything. It takes too long. The quickest way to do anything is not to do it at all. I'm going to go through one star. Then I call. Then I do it again. I do my second pass. Two stars, two stars. I'm getting rid of everything in between, so I'm comparing them to each other. When I get to three stars, okay, now I'm really seeing the ones I like. That's a three star. Between these two, this is a three star. This is a three star. Three stars. I never want to see the other images again, right? That's the whole point. We're not going to spend our time deleting our images. We're just going to spend our time finding our images because it's the most efficient way to do this. How do we bring the, the autopilot scenario into this scenario? Well, now that I've keyworded these, and now that I've called these, when I click on this folder and I click back, by default, this is what's gonna happen. I'm starting from scratch. It's automatically gonna turn that filter off. I have to turn that filter back on every time. So what I can do is hit this lock button here. But when I do that and I click on another folder or another folder, this happens. I sort by no stars here. Let's say I didn't get to this folder. I click back on this folder. I'm like, yeah, I got to three stars. Click on the next folder. I don't see any images. Click on the next folder, I don't see any images. Right? Because it's locking that for all of your folders. So here's what you want to do. File, library, filters. Remember each source's filter separately. Why is that important? Because it will remember that this folder is three stars and only showing my three stars or greater images. If I edited this photo, if I went through and I said, you know what, I really like this a little bit cooler, recover the highlights, add some clarity, some dehaze, bring some punch back into it, bring the shadows up. I really like this. Anytime I edit an image, every star has a meaning. Four stars. Now I could just, just show you my four star pictures. Now when I go back to this folder, let's say I only got two, one star, and I got called for dinner, I got tired. When I go back to that folder, 
it remembers where I left off, my four star images. So now we're automating the process of you never need to look at your entire folder structure again. You only, when you click on any given day, it's just gonna show you the images that you want to see. Everything else disappears. We don't have to take the time or waste the time finding and deleting images because they represent the majority of your images. Unfortunately, that's just the reality of a photographer, right? We have more images we don't like than images we do like. So we're just gonna spend our time finding our best images. Now we can do this from a folder basis by day. Another reason why I organize by day. We can also do this on a monthly basis. So click on that month. That's a technically a folder. Show me just my three star images for the entire month. You don't have to find the specific days now. Then you can go to a year. Show me just my four star images for the entire year. Why is that handy? Because now if you look for a really quick way to find your images, just click on the year and you're only going to see your best images. Then you can right click on any one of these images here, go to folder and library, and then just go back down on some of these stars or turn the filter off entirely to find the rest of the images from that shoot because they're organized by date. That's how you're going to find every image. So from here on in, the system fully automated, you can find every image just by clicking once for the location, the keyword, the who, the what, and the where, and then one more to filter by four stars or three stars. So one click import, automate the process of organizing it, importing it, sorting it. And once we keyword and call, it's two clicks to get to not just all the pictures of Nelson, not just all the pictures of white painting, your best ones. Every image you've ever shot, two clicks away. There's much more to cover in here, <laughs> but we already are a few minutes over time. Um, Scott, you, you let me know, you know how much wiggle room we have. I'm happy to, to answer questions or throw a bit more into um, yeah. this as well, because there yeah, is a lot to cover. Definitely, definitely, Cliff. I mean, you know, we, we, we can kind of hang out till like 6.15 or so, you know. Okay, cool. Kind of go over, let you, let you have a little stretch right. there. There's another 10 or 15 minutes. So if there's anything that stands out to you guys in the audience, let me know. We cover the import, we cover the throughput for the most part, the auto sync of adjustments, the, the panoramics mode, we can automate the process of that. That's pretty simple to do. Match total exposures is something that might be worth knowing about. So let's say that we, we like this image and we notice that this image was a little bit darker. And the image before that, well, maybe that one was just a little bit too bright. Now, yeah, we can auto adjust like the way I showed you before, right? And that will just bring us back into a launching point. But I think that's just a little bit too dark, right? I actually like what I did for this image here. I made it just a little bit brighter, about a stop brighter. We can't automate that process. Because when we hit auto adjust, it's just gonna choose what it thinks is a, is a good launching point. And that's fine. But what we can do here is a couple of ways. One, if I like the way I like this. So if you're a wedding photographer, you're shooting events, you're shooting a lot of images, a quantity of images, you can just edit one photo to the brightness that you want. I can select these other ones here. That one's too bright, that one's too dark. As long as I have that one is more selected, slightly brighter you can use something called match total exposures. Now, another tip I can show you is if you're not sure where things are on the menu, come over here to help and literally just type in what you're looking for. And it'll tell you it's there and show you where it is and then show you the shortcut for that as well. So under settings, match total exposures. Now, if you pay attention to this bar on the, on the bottom there, I'll just go G to go back to my grid. Now it's matching the exposure of the exposure that I chose, rather than just a launching point that Adobe chooses. So if everything you like a little, like a stop writer or stop writer, if you're shooting snow, for instance, or shooting a wedding, you want this certain look, or shooting something dramatic, it's a little bit darker, you edit one photo, and you're matching the exposures to the exposure that you're choosing. Another way you can do it is if I like this, I like these exact settings, but I wanna apply it to these other images. Again, I can select all these images. I can select the whole group if I wanted to. 
and then I can say sync metadata and I can sync, I'm sorry, not sync metadata, sync settings. And I can choose all the settings, just some settings. I can say check all. Typically you don't want to sync the spot removal or the crop. Although sometimes if you have a dust spot, you can actually sync the spot removal and, and automate the process of removing your dust spots. Just keep in mind, you have to pay attention to that because it's choosing a part of your image that might change from image to image. So, so but it will work. You just have to pay a little bit more careful attention to it. Just review the results. And now it's just going to auto sync the settings from that one image to all the others. So it's just going to sync the settings from one to the other, right? I can auto sync it as well, but it's safer just to have these sync settings the way they are. Okay, so that was really important to show you. That covers the throughput. The digital asset management, we cover the who, the what, and the where. Um, automate culling, we talked about that. So what I do when I work with my students is it just like blows their mind that I can find every image within two, two clicks. When you click on a folder, it's just gonna recognize and remember the number of stars. You can click on all photographs here, go to attribute and say only five stars. Your five stars only represent your portfolio shots. So one star, two star, three stars, those are multiple passes. Four stars, rec uh, so when you get to three stars, usually it's like 10% or less of your images. Those are the ones you wanna take your time to edit, not anything else, you're wasting your time. You wanna identify your best images first, then edit. The ones you edit become four stars. Those are your best images of the day, of the shoot, of the event. And the ones you really like, they're the best across the board, your portfolio shots, those are five stars. So at any point, and my clients always freak out when I show them this, just click on all photographs, and all of your five stars will just be there, your best images. Then you can go to any one of these images. You just go down one, four stars, three stars, and you'll just see the other images surround them. So your all photographs, your parent folder, portfolio shots, your best shots, your one click away. You can click on any given year and find your four stars or greater, your best images of that year. Click on any day, you're finding your three stars or greater, which is the images basically that you want to look at, the ones that are worth looking at and editing. All that happens is just like a big machine that builds upon itself, removing you from the equation. Everything you do, you only have to do once. Let's see if there's anything else and then we'll wrap this up and answer any questions. Um, the finding we talked about, the culling process, this is something for you guys to know as well. I uh, had a really nice long conversation with the developers of this company uh, yesterday. I met them out in WPPI in Las Vegas last week and what they're developing is an AI algorithm that's gonna help you identify the best images. Notice how I said one star, two star, three star. We're doing this manually. This is gonna help us automate the process of finding our keepers. Really, really interesting. So right now they're, they're adopting this for the wedding, the event industry. So they're letting you understand which images are all the images that are sharp and have their eyes open, for instance. Really, really cool stuff. This will save you so much time. What I spoke to them is what to their lead engineers and, and the owner of the company about developing an aspect of this that will, that will really be powerful across the board. So helping us identify the images that are the brightest possible images without blowing out the highlights. The images that are sharpest images across the range of bracketed photos. Um, identifying images so that we can get down to three stars without doing that manual process of one star, two star, three stars, but in a way that gives the flexibility of undoing that because we're not consistent. So it's coming down the pike, that automation of literally everything, even that culling stage is getting you to a launching point. So you can disregard images that are too blurry automatically, images that where people have eyes closed automatically and only look at the images that have potential for essentially your three star images. That's how we fully automate all of this. Uh, last thing I'm going to show you, because it is worth showing you, it's just going to take a couple of minutes. Um, two things. One, your backup. Automating your backup is absolutely essential. You don't have to worry about doing this all the time or remembering how to do it, because if you have to remember how to do it, you're not going to do it. So how do we automate the backup of a process? We want to back up both our catalog and our images. Right? It makes sense. Our catalog is just a directory of our images but it keeps track of all of our adjustments, our stars, our flags, our keywords. Then we have our images ourselves. Our catalog will get backed up automatically. And we do that when we quit our catalog.
I'm going to open up my main calendar just to show you that too. Because we have to set this up under settings briefly. So when Lightroom opens up, you're going to go to, here we go. You're going to go to catalog settings. And we can change when it's going to tell us to back this up. So every time Lightroom exits is what I would recommend. Now, when we quit this, I'm not going to do it now because it's going to take a little bit of time. But when we quit this, we can automate the process of where we back this up. Not just the fact that we're backing it up. That's the first step. Back it up every single time. But also, we can choose a location. So the location I would choose, if I hover over this, it'll, it'll tell you. I'm putting this on Google Drive. You want to put it on Dropbox or Google Drive or a shared folder. Why? Because once you do that, it's backing up to the cloud. If all hell breaks loose, like let's face it, there's historic floods and fires and hurricanes. It's crazy. I'm waiting for locusts that are coming next week. If we back this up to the cloud, we do this automatically. There's nothing left to think about. We click this one button back up. That's it. It gets pushed to our computer, shared folder, backed up automatically to the cloud. If we want to do the same thing for our images, what we do is grab this folder. Right, it's going to say all photographs, and we would move this over to a folder on Google Drive. Literally, just drag it over. All photographs done. That's going to start backing up to the cloud automatically. This works for if you have less than about one or two terabytes of files. Right, if you have more than that, Google starts to charge you a lot of money. But it's a really good solution for those of you getting started that have less than about one to two terabytes. Or it can just back up your most recent year. That's actually typically what I do. Just back up the last year's worth. Lightroom will point to this new location. And now your images as well as your catalog, again, you're automating the process of backing both of those up with literally doing nothing at all. There's not even one click, it's nothing. It just happens in the background. As long as you're on Wi-Fi, it's going to work on the background for you. And a lot of people are saying, well, you just moved your entire folder. Everything is going to break. Yeah, but that's fine. I'll show you what that looks like. You can only have one catalog at a time. It's another reason why you only want to use one catalog. You can only sync one catalog to the cloud, by the way. That's one of the biggest reasons. Um, now that everything is broken, I have that parent folder. This is why that parent folder is so important. Find missing folder. I can go to Google Drive and see where I put it and just, just sync it back up. Everything will fall right back into line. But now it's syncing to the cloud without me doing anything at all. So when my clients go to Africa, when they go to China, when they, I've one in Alaska right now, they get a large memory card, put the images in after every day, and they're done before everybody else because they just hit one button, import. The images stay on their memory card, Images get pushed onto their SSD. And then also because that's stored in the cloud, that gets pushed up to the cloud, depending on how much, how much service they have. The images are on multiple places, online and offline, organized by folder automatically just by one press of a button. Last thing I'll show you is if you want to create a portfolio and share it in social media, here's how we would do that. We're going to create a smart collection. Now I'm going to say, um, favorites, five stars. Just show me all the images that are five stars. It's an easy one to do. Anytime I come across an image now, and I say, you know what? Let's go to that other image I, that I liked. Let's make that a five star. Notice how that number just grew. Here's my five star images. Great. Now we have one click to find all the images. We're always finding faster ways. If you're searching for things over and over again, my favorite pictures of all the family. You can do that with a smart collection. Family favorites, all the five-star images that have a keyword, other metadata keyword, Cliff, and then do that for each family member. Favorites of Cliff. Or family favorites, you can do that for each family member. And you'd say match all. And now, and I do this for all my students. 
they have one click. It is for some, some very high profile people, even in National Geographic, they're like, they have access to everybody. And I was the only person that actually able to help them figure out, this is how you automate the process of finding every image. And they, they were shocked uh, when, they, when I showed them how to do this. And these are just basically saved searches you never have to worry about again. Now there's nothing there because there's no picture of me. That's five stars. So we can fix that. And now we have five star cliff, right? That'll automatically just show up. It'll auto populate. Here's the problem. We can't move things around and we can't sync them to the cloud. So here's the last thing I'm going to leave you with. We have our smart collections, which are building based upon our keywords and our calling, basically the description of our images, the keywords, and the stars that we apply. We find all the pictures of Mexico, all the pictures of Cliff, then we find the best ones. Smart Collection is going to auto-populate those. That brings in all the who, the what, and the where, and also the best images, auto-populates it. Now the one last step is how do we automate the process of sharing? So we created a Smart Collection, then we can create another collection outside of that. We can say favorites. I can call it five, five star images, whatever we want to call it, right? We just can't have the exact same name. We can put a period next to it, whatever. But this is a regular collection or a dumb collection. I'm going to sync this with the cloud. I'm not doing it in this catalog because I already have my primary catalog sync. That's easy enough to do. You just right click and you can choose sync. Now, when I do that, I have my smart collection, favorite five stars. I can just command A, select all those images, drag them into my dumb collection. And I can do this every now and again, just drag them. It's only going to drag in your newer pictures, the ones that were added based upon the criteria that you set. The reason why you have a, a dumb collection right next to a smart collection, because the smart collection will auto-populate, the dumb collection we can now rearrange, bring in our best images, remove them if we want to, and sync those to our devices. From there, this is how we push to social media. All of our best images by any criteria will show up for the smart collection first based upon those parameters. A dumb collection, just drag them into the dumb collection, reorder them, and now that all that will show up on your phone. Your smart collection will build automatically. Nothing you need to do as, all, as a keyword and call, automatically build, and every now and again, as you have more and more images in your smart collection, drag all of them over and it will just bring in the newer pictures. It's not going to duplicate them. And that's how we automate the entire workflow. So that's about it. That really is, I know we probably went 10 or 15 minutes over, um, but it was a lot to cover. I really wanted to walk you through the entire process. Uh, I do understand there's a lot to cover there. Um, know that one, you can reach out if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. Um, cliffordpicket.com to find the contact information. The boot camp I have next weekend, uh, I told you I'd give you a discount. If you guys shoot me an email about this, tell me you watch this. This is only going to be good until tomorrow night. I'm doing one more class tomorrow. I get you $250 off. I can send you a little discount code for that. It's a two day workshop, fully intensive, walks you through with your computer, your catalog, everything you need to know. Uh, and that should be it. I'm happy to answer any questions. I know we only have a minute or two. Uh, but if there are more detailed questions, just reach out anytime. I'm happy to, I'm genuinely happy to be a resource to you guys. Awesome. Awesome. Cliff, uh, first of all, thank you so much. I mean, you know, I, I know like we talked about yesterday, same thing for today, you know, we're always kind of squeezed for time and that's always, you know, an issue that we've run into. <laughs> yeah. I'm always racing we... against the clock. <laughs> yeah. I like, I like that you have the timer over there. You know, we, we, we've got different methods of people who have been on the event space, you know, timers and, you know, like little, little kind of reminders and alarms that go off. So, you know, they, they, they come in handy. Uh, but um, in terms of that, that first kind of slide that you were kind of going through the, the mapping kind of that, that whole sort of oh, the mind map. Of, yeah. of how you do that, um, is that something that you kind of would share with people or is that more something you got to you gotta show up to the boot camp? I can share it with people. Just shoot me an email. I do have a version on my website too. If you click under resources, um, you're going to find all the gear that I use. Yeah, you're going to find all the gear that I use, um, all of it. Um, yeah, there's a lot. I'm happy to share the specific version of this as well. 
uh, but you're going to find a lot more awesome. information about the workshops and the gear. Um, this is, it's not going awesome, to help you much. And then, to you this. know, just in terms. Yeah, it's just there to keep me on point, but these are all the things, every aspect of Lightroom that you need to know about, because honestly, you know, you don't know what you don't know. That's my job is to show you all these things that you had no idea were possible that are going to save you not hours, but days of your workflow. I'm going to give back to you. So it's a, it's a lot to cover and that's why I don't want to rush it. I spend the time helping you discover this using your computer, your images. We go through a half day just on post-processing, walking through the visual workflow that I created. I will mention that I do have a little bit of a cheat sheet, a Cliff Notes um, on my desktop. I can certainly shoot that over to you guys too. This gives like a another way of how my mind works, but it basically just a little bit of a cheat sheet as to the culling system I talked about, some tips, um, the visual workflow over here, all the keyboard shortcuts to Lightroom. I'm happy to shoot that over to you guys as well if you, if you send me an email. And we'll be covering a little bit more of that, all the tips and tricks tomorrow as well. Awesome, awesome. So a little spoiler alert there, uh, but definitely make sure you tune in. Uh, Cliff will be back tomorrow again with some top secret stuff that he's gonna dive into. So kind of, you know, tips and tricks like he was talking about. Um, and like Cliff said, if you do have any questions, feel free to email him. Uh, Cliff, I wanna thank you again for being here both yesterday and today and for gonna, you know, you're gonna be here again tomorrow. So I wanna thank you in advance for that. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure everybody, you know, wants to get out of here, especially you, Cliff. I'm sure you want to turn that fan back on <laughs> get, get some air circulation going. So uh, I'll let you go. But thank you very much again uh, to everybody who tuned in tonight. Thank you very much. This has been another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space, and we'll catch you next time.